could you do it? Could we lift all the house lights up just for this time? That would be, wow, there are people in here. That's amazing. I love it. How, just, just by the way of um, one, because I'm ADD and I'll be less distracted, can someone help me with those doors back there like clo- by closing them? I'll be looking at trees and leaves and sunshine, and I'm like, sunshine in the northwest. I need to go outside look at mountains because in Missouri, we don't have mountains. We have hills, and uh, we, we actually, uh, just, to, just to give you a quick, uh, a little bit about me, my, my role and responsibility at James River Church is I work with our college, and so I get to work with, uh, right now, approximately, we're, we're about 92 students uh, in our leadership college, and um, next year we already have 128 applications. Uh, our goal is to have 500 applications this year, and it's amazing to see what God's doing, but my job, my responsibility is student development, so I get to work with students all the time. I, I'm in charge of chapels. I'm in charge of uh, make sure they stay for both years. We're not interested in just having someone come, who, and here, here's the reason more than anything. We want students to follow the calling that God has on their life, if God calls you to a place, there's a purpose for you being in that place, and it's not for you to run away. And so even during the tough months and the tough times and the studies and everything, we want to encourage them. And so when they hired me, they said, hey, we need you to do two things. And I was ready. I was, this is our interview. This was, this was my interview for the job. They're like, one, do you love Jesus? I'm like, absolutely. And they're like, yeah, we know you. You know us. And um, so here's what we need you to do. I want you to think about it and get back with us as soon as you can. We want you to love God. I'm like, check. I can do that. And we need you to love the students. Yes. And then, like, in one of the ways we want you to do that is to take them to either coffee or lunch five to eight times a week. And I was like, Lord, you have provided the job of the ages for this slightly overweight young man. And I'm I'm anxious and I'm excited. But uh, so that's that's what I do. And uh, so our students, I'm always trying to find ways to connect with them. So a few weeks ago, some of our graduates were, uh, I'm trying to do better about getting in shape and walking and, and exercising because I believe that um, I, I had gotten way to the, to the largest I'd ever gotten physically. And um, I mean, I couldn't breathe. I, I mean, I was exhausted by two o'clock in the afternoon. And uh, I mean, that's, and that's after getting up at seven o'clock every morning. I'm like two o'clock. I'm like, oh man. Um, I share an office with a guy who I want, I'm trying to uh, build, not build, like we're, we're great friends, but I want him to see what ministry looks like, not just behind, you know, in, in a meeting here and there, but see what I do through the day. And so I actually put him in my office. And so we share an office together and I'm always trying to, at that time I was like, bro, could you go like, um, run to Springfield and back for me and get something. I just need to take a nap, just get out of the office. You know, I was exhausted. So one of the ways is hiking, and they're like, let's go climb some mountains. And I'm like, okay, boys, first of all, we don't have mountains. And they're like, oh, no, 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 up at this trail. And I'm like, stop, stop. I know you've never been out of Nebraska or Missouri, but Nebraska's flat. Missouri's, like, kind of flat. And... So it, I, I love the Northwest. I love the beauty of the Northwest. I love the people of the Northwest. Here's what I said. Some of our closest friends today still, and we've lived in Springfield now 10 years. I don't know if this is a good thing or a bad thing, um, but we've lived in Springfield 10 years, and we still say that our closest friends are in the Northwest. Because when you build relationships here, it's true relationship. Everyone will say hi to you in the streets of Springfield, Missouri. You walk by, hey, how's it going? Hey, 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 how you doing? This morning, I went for a little, I, I say a run. It was a lot of walking with a little bit of jogging. And um, I was going up and down the hills in Everett, and it was beautiful out this morning. And, and I forget, people don't really want to say hi to me. I'm like, hey. And they're like, well. <laughs> you know, like, why are you talking? It's 7 o'clock in the morning. You know, and, and so it was, it was uh, interesting. But um, I love the Northwest. I love being here. Uh, this morning, um, I want to talk about if that's, what, if that's what you want. And for me, my vision and my passion is to lift up the, the, the hands of my leader and, and to, to really carry out his goal and his vision. His, his goal, his vision uh, for our college is 300 students a year. Okay? So it's my job, it's my responsibility somehow to figure out how to get 300 students there. 
You know, it doesn't mean we drop the price. Does it mean that we go out more? Does it mean that we do more conventions and events and more meetings? Well, of course it does. Because if that's what it takes, that's what you need to do. And uh, it all started real quick. Um, you know, I grew up in ministry. Uh, my dad, like I said last night, some of you heard this, my, my dad was my pastor growing up. And um, I was in fifth grade. And we, we had an amazing uh, bus ministry at our church, small town in Indiana. The, the town may today run 2,800, something like that. It's less than 3,000 people. And we would have 100 children uh, on a Wednesday night come in for service. We had about 30 people in our church. But because we had offered that bus ministry, they would, and, and listen, we didn't care about seat belts. We didn't care about safety. We just wanted those kids on that bus and get them there, right? We're talking in the 80s when it didn't matter. And I was, everyone, in the 1980s, like, do you have a seat belt in your car? You know, it's just like, we just packed them in, and they'd send them out again and just pack them in again. And then people after the, after, I mean, this was so, such a different a, a day and age, right? People after would take those kids home in their own cars. They'd just go, okay, everyone jump in. And they'd put like six kids in the car, and they'd take them home. And, and we were ministering. And what happened was we had a, a guy came in the church. Uh, he had a destructive purpose. And his, his purpose was to be the pastor of the church. And dad brought him along and really appreciated his help. And, and next thing you know, things just started happening. That Dad was like, man, this is not right. Where is this coming from? Began to be stressed. He was never a full-time pastor uh, up until about four years ago. He started pastoring a little country church in Indiana. And I say country, I mean country. Like there's nothing out there. They're, they have a graveyard in the back of the house, you're just like, wow, that's a cemetery right there. Like mom's like, cook, like cleaning dishes, you know. They don't even have a dishwasher in their house. I mean, that's how old the house is. And she's just washing dishes. And I'm like, you just stare at the cemetery. That's horrible. And, uh, but, it, I mean, always working two jobs. He was a coal miner. And so he, he d uh, dug coal and, and he worked on the coal trucks and, and did blasting for the coal mine for almost 25 years. He was six months short of his retirement when they shut the coal mine down, so he got nothing. And uh, so, I mean, he's, he's my hero. He was a cop. I mean, if, if you name something, my dad has probably done it, and he tried to teach his kids how to do it, too. And the greatest thing that he taught me was to love people. It doesn't matter where you're at and what you're doing, you love people. And it doesn't matter what they look like. It doesn't matter how they smell. It doesn't matter how much money they have. You love them. And um, my dad's 6'5", 285 pounds, and uh, he gives the greatest hug ever. Every time I see him, I, I don't even say anything. I just come up, and I'm like, Dad. <laughs> and he just kind of swallows me up. So anyway, what, uh, the reason I'm telling you the story is uh, fifth grade. Uh, we're pastoring this church. And that guy and another board member um, began to tell rumors about the church. And they were telling the people, the community, man, I don't know if I'd send your kids there because they're, they're taking kids in rooms and forcing them to, to speak in tongues. Which, if you're not in an AG church or a Pentecostal church, that's a really, really scary thing. And we were from a very uh, liturgical uh, community, you know, a lot of Catholic influence, a lot, and they're just like, oh, well, don't send your kids there. And they're telling their neighbors, hey, I wouldn't send them there. Small town, you can imagine that fire grew pretty quick. So my dad gets word of it as he's on the phone and he's, we, we had the family tradition of never eating around the table. We always ate in the living room around a TV. And um, my dad had this big oversized chair, and he was sitting there eating his food. And uh, someone called, and he takes the call, of course, because, you know, uh, pastors are always on call, and they should never have a day off. That's not true. Don't believe any of that. And um, he took the call. They begin to discuss. And the next thing you know, he's laying in the floor face down uh, with what we thought at the time was a heart attack. And so... Really, we watched this whole, I watched this whole thing. I, mean, I remember, I can remember him falling, the food on the floor. I remember the ambulance coming. I remember the guys who were, uh, who were on that ambulance to this day. I could tell you, you know, I could tell you who they are. And one of the guys' name was Sparky. And uh, his last name is Sparks. And, and I, I always remember rushing to the hospital and seeing my dad alive. And instead of getting bitter or angry, I made a commitment at fifth grade. I'll always take care of my dad. I won't let anyone hurt him anymore. So when it comes to, to helping the pastor of my church, my commitment is to him, I'm here to help you and serve you. No one will talk about about you. Because if, if people are talking about about your pastor to you, 
then what's that say about you? What makes them so comfortable that they can come talk bad about other people to you, especially your leader? Would you let them talk bad about Jesus to you? Because if Jesus is all authority and he's given all authority and he's put people in the place, he's put our leaders, our governing officials, our pastors, those in authority above us, if he's put them there, then who does that make you to talk bad about them? So, my heart is to protect my leader. Uh, a few weeks ago, uh, it really threw me for a loop. It, I mean, it messed me up for, for about seven days. I was uh, getting, I went up to our gym. We have a fitness center in the gym, a little bit about the church. Church runs 12,000 plus. Uh, every week we're seeing people come to Jesus. It's a supernatural move. It's an anomaly, many would say, and we would agree with that. We recognize every single day one of our core values is to remain in a constant awe of what God is doing. Never take it for granted and never get bored with it, right? Just remember that when you walk through the hall of your church on Sunday morning that God has put you there and he's going to change lives and he's changed your life. Amen? So um, I, I want to be careful of time. I don't want to, uh, to, to tell stories too long, but um, so I I'm, I'm, I'm go up, I, I begin, and I put on this song. Uh, I'm listening to worship as I'm, I'm getting ready to wa- walk and run around the track, and I get one lap in, and I, and I go to this song, and instantly I start crying walking around the track because I just, I just love the song. I love that presence that came with it. I love it. I just wanted to spend time with the Lord while I was working out. And he goes, I want you to go walk around the auditorium. So in our church, there's a, it's a square box, and you, just, you can walk around it. Uh, and just kind of give you an idea of our, of our auditorium, if you walk around that, I believe it's 12 times, it's one mile. And so I, w- I went down, and I'm excited, and I'm praying, and I'm crying, and I'm, I'm literally walking down the halls at, at 6 o'clock in the morning, 6.30 in the morning, with my hands lifted up. And I'm just starting, and I just get past where our pastor's office is, and I'm praying for pastor, and I... And I'm like, Lord, and if you would just, and I look down, and someone's laying in our hallway. And I was like, oh, <laughs> good, good morning. You know, I'm like, and, and he had a hat over his eyes, and he pops up, and we have this discussion. And I was fine with the discussion until he started talking about my team. Well, it just grieves me because your team's doing this, and, that, and I'm like, whoa, time out. Let me caution you. Let me just slow you down. That's my team. Well, who are you? I'm a pastor on this staff, that's my team. We're a team, we are, it's we instead of the device of they, that's one of our, our, our core commitments. We don't talk about, oh, it was their decision, it's our decision. Are you following me so far? And then at the end, I'm like, hey, listen, after 45 minutes of this conversation, and there were some good things, and there's some things I was trying to help him with, and other things I'm going, I have no idea what you're talking about. At the end of it, he says, you know what, you have no passion for your leader. And I'm like, okay, now I know he's completely off. Because when it comes to people I would die for, Tammy, Ty, and Maddie, and my pastors. Period. Why? Because when God puts you on the team, your responsibility is to protect the pastor, to lift up their arms, to guard them, to help them, to love them. And you know what? If your commitment is not to love your pastor and to love his vision, then ask God where your commitment should be. I want to break it down like this. I want want, maybe maybe for a better title, we'll call it loopholes and legacies. In what you're doing, will you look for the loophole to get it done the easy way, or will you do it in such a way that's going to leave a legacy for your church and for your leader? Ultimately, it's easy to serve a leader like I do for Pastor John. Um, because his legacy is not built on his personality. It's built on the word of God. So we believe in uh, preaching verse by verse through the Bible. And so he's been on staff. His heart was to preach the entire New Testament verse by verse. So it took him just over 25 years, but he has preached the entire New Testament every single verse on a Sunday morning. Commitment to Scripture. And you know what? You know what that causes for us? That causes a lot of hard sermons. Because there's a lot of topics that you're like, you know, culturally, that'd be a little sensitive right now. So let's stay away from that one. No, you don't get the choice. You have to preach the word of God. 
And so we're looking for ways that we can leave a legacy, and it's not because of my, my personality or my pastor's personality. Uh, the, the legacy we want to live is that this is the word of God, and you can trust it, and you can stand on it because Jesus Christ is the same today, yesterday, forever, all eternity. God is faithful to you. He's provided a way. To, you know, you, that's what you build your legacy on. So there's two guys I want to visit real quick, and, um, and, I, and I hope that you, you appreciate these stories as much as I do. Um, 1 Samuel 26, if you would go in your Bibles there. Uh, my wife um, hijacked my Bible this morning. I was like, it's okay. You're prettier than I am. You can have whatever you want, and you can take my Bible. So I'm going to read from my glowing Bible this morning. Hey, while I'm looking this up, let me, let me give you a couple of resources, uh, a couple of things that I'm reading or have recently read. Uh, the Energy Bus by John Gordon. I don't know if you're familiar with any of his work. It's a great read. It's a simple read. Um, my, my boss, my director, gave it to me. He's like, hey, I want you to read this. I think you'll enjoy it. It, it took me just a few days to read. I'm a very slow reader, um, but I've applied a ton of those things to this. The author, John Gordon, it's a business leadership book, but he is a believer. Matter of fact, in the forward, uh, he thanks the Holy Spirit for the words that were given to him for the, for the writing of that book. And so it wasn't just like, hey, thanks, God. You know, I just want to thank God for this award. You know, it was like you could tell in the writings, though, too, that there's relationship there with the Lord. Um, the other book, um, uh, Ego is the Enemy. Uh, just, just, just a warning, that is a secular read. There is language in it, so don't be offended or think that I don't love Jesus because there's words in there that you wouldn't use on a Sunday morning in front of children. Um, but it's a good book. Um, so that's just a couple of reads um, that I've just re recently read. I'm getting ready to read The Seed uh, by John Gordon as well. And um, one that I believe that works great in ministry is a guy, Patrick Lencioni, uh, the book that, uh, probably my favorite book that he has written is Politics, Silos, and Turf Wars. And it talks about quit, quit working within your silo uh, in the church. Or for us, the, 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 the practicality of it would be the church. He talks about businesses. I believe he actually brings up churches in it. And, you know, he talks about the difference between a hospital and a hotel. Uh, the hospital, if there's an emergency going on, everyone's hands-on and helping out, including the janitor. As opposed to when you go to a hotel, they're like, oh, that's, that's the room service fault, or that's the front desk fault, or that's their fault, and they just blame. No, just get it done, you know, and work together as a team. So those are a couple of reads. First um, Samuel chapter 26 has got to be one of my favorite stories in all of the Bible. I love sharing it because it's a, about a guy named Abishai. And Abishai is one of David's mighty men. He's strong. He's a man of valor. He's not a, he's not a, he's not a thinker. He doesn't think about things very often. And um, in this story, uh, Abishai and David are, um, they're, they're getting ready to um, take care of some business. I don't know if you're familiar with the story. Let me just break it down to you real quickly just, just for the sake of time. What time are we out? Are we out at noon? Is that good for you guys? 11, you're like 11.45 is better. Uh, <laughs> does anyone know, schedule-wise? 12.15. Let's, let's let you out. Of, let, let's, let's, I'll try to end the next 20 minutes, give you time for questions. You can ask me questions about the church, about our children's ministry, about uh, how we do ministry as a church, as a family, or whatever. Is that good? You like that? A little Q&A time. So be thinking of questions. Don't make me stand up here and beg. All right, here we go. So I'll, I'll break the story down, and then we'll go into a couple of points. Um, the story of Abishai, Abishai and David are standing uh, uh, up on top of the hill, and I believe it's Ahimelech, uh, uh, are standing up there, and he, David's looking out over the hill. He's looking into Saul's camp. So he's up on the hill. He's looking in the camp, and there are thousands of men in this camp with Saul. They're not just people. They're, it's just not a city. It's his military. It's his top brass. So he looks down. And he knows that he has to go in and meet with Saul. It's night, and the Bible actually says, and the Spirit of the Lord came upon them, put them into a deep sleep. David doesn't know that. Abishai doesn't know that. Nobody really knows that. But David says, I've got to go down 
so who will go with me? As he's talking to Abishai and Ahimelech, and, and Abishai doesn't even hesitate. He's like, I'm in. Leader, if that's what you want, then I'm in. A lot of the times our, our leaders will ask us to do things that seem crazy, and you're like, what are you doing? That makes no sense. But he doesn't describe to you, or she doesn't describe to you that, that the previous two or three nights they've been sleepless because of the vision that God's put on their heart. That they, they can't get it off their mind and their heart. And they're, you know, it's time to do this. We've got to move forward. We've got to make this change. I remember when James River went from, um, they went from Sunday school class, and we had one of the largest adult Bible fellowships in the entire uh, denomination, and pastor made the decision uh, with that of key relationship and, and, and talking through it with the, with the board and with the staff to end that and begin life groups. And it was just like, people were like, what are we doing? There were, there were a couple of decisions like changing the, the stage, you know, putting a, a big black curtain up there as, as opposed to the ivory towers that they had. And thousands of people left the church. But can I tell you, though, when God leads you to something, you have to follow his direction, not your own? Even though there were a couple thousand people who left the church that year, I believe the number was like 3,400 people came to the church. More people were drawn in. More people were welcomed. More people, they just changed things. So it's not our choice to sit back and question everything that the leader is asking us to do. Now, you can ask questions, but that's different than questioning. Does that make sense? It's different than questioning. So here they are. They're, they go down, and they begin this, this journey. They go down the hill. They walk up, and listen to this. This is probably one of the, the key parts of the story. They get into the middle of the camp, and Abishai looks at David, and he goes, I can take care of this. You've been running from Saul a long time. We've been running from Saul a long time. This is uncomfortable. We, I, I don't like that you can't sleep and that you're constantly on the run. You're, we're hiding in caves. Saul's spear is right beside him. And he goes, David, let me take care of this. It won't take me twice. He says, let me take the spear I will run it through him. I won't miss his heart. I will drive it straight through him, and it's over. This is what David says. How dare you threaten God's anointed? But, but it's not easy. But it's not time. Because just as much as I'm your leader, he's my leader. And I'm running from him, and it hurts, and it's uncomfortable, and I get in trouble by him a lot. <laughs> that was my journey for about the first four years. It's so funny. I'm, I, I see two of my uh, really key people in my, in my children's lives, Pastor Denise Giese and uh, Sean Backus, who we were on a staff together. And they probably look at me up here going, why is this guy even speaking to anybody? How did he even make it past the first four years? But, but, but again, key people, but in the beginning times, you know what? I learned a few lessons. You know what? Carry out my leader's vision instead of my own, and it gets me less conversations. Because if your leader's always constantly questioning, why are you doing that? It usually amounts to you're carrying out your own vision. And then you have people that surround you in the church that go, you know what? I wish we did it this way. You know, I know it's in your heart to do it this way, and I wish we did it that way too. But those conversations don't happen when all you talk about is your leader's vision and not your own. Are you following me? So what do you want? If your pastor's going, hey, we need this to grow, or we need this to be different, then say, you know what, pastor, that's a, that's a great statement. And you know what, I am, I am 100% with you. Pastor, matter of fact, I've never been more with you than I am right now. Can we just take three hours in an afternoon and really look at what this looks like. What do we really want it to look like? Because, Pastor, I'm here for your vision. Let me, let me give you a couple of thoughts when it comes to uh, following your leader's vision. One, know your leader. 
Know about your leader. Know what your leader likes. I don't like the Denver Broncos. I like Peyton Manning when he played for them, but I don't like the Broncos. If you are a, a Seahawks fan at all, you don't like the Broncos. No one likes the Patriots. Let's just put that out there right now. <laughs> Nobody. People from New England, they, they, are, they are great people. My boss is from New England. He's a Patriots fan. He's a Red Sox fan. And I'm like, Jesus, why have you put me in such a hard time to serve someone like this? You know, and, and, but my pastor likes the Denver Broncos, so guess what? I know about the Denver Broncos. I know about his team. You're like, is that important? It helps with conversation. I don't, I don't just like the Denver Broncos, or, or I, I just don't know about them so I can, you know, trick my pastor. No, if it's important to him, it should be important to me. You could write that down. If it's important to your pastor, it should be important to you. Your pastor will talk about the things that are important to him. Right? Amen? If you're married to the pastor and you're doing the children's ministry, which happens a lot, you know what's important. To carry it out. To encourage. Um, let's, let's go to another, uh, another quick thing. Um, pray for your pastor. It's really hard to talk bad about your pastor if you're praying for your pastor. <laughs> I kind of me mentioned that just a little bit last night. It's, it's, different, it's difficult to, to, to lift up the praise of the father if you're talking about the father's children all the time. Pray for your pastor. Pray for him, 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 and then pray for him some more. Or her, sorry. I lean to him because that's what I serve under. Pray for your pastor. Number three, uh, never put your leader in a spot where they have to say no. You're like, well, how do we do that? Know their vision. Because if it lines up with the vision and it's a big change or it's a big option, then if it lines up with the pastor's vision, guess what? They're more likely to say yes. Yes, because that's what I want us to do. That's where I want us to go. That's the direction we need to head. Yes. If there's an issue, number four, if there's a problem, provide three or four solutions that uh, match up with the leader's vision. Don't create a problem or a situation that manipulates your vision to come in to the side of his vision. Oh, pastor, I see this as a problem. I know you don't get to spend much time in the children's ministry or helping with that area, but here, it's a real problem. You know what I think we could do is this right here. Because that's what you want to do. You're like, man, you, you really speak strong about this. Absolutely. Because when it comes to the growth of the local church, there can only be one vision for that local church. If there's multiple visions, really what you're doing is you're, so, you're, you're, you're setting up these subcultures which lead to multiple churches. And so the, the kids are learning one way and the parents are learning another. And guess what? Now the home is colliding. You know, we, we've moved everything in our church to James River kids, James River youth. We don't have different names for them anymore. We don't have, a, it's James River College. It's not James River Leadership College. It's James River College. It defines who we are as a church, as a body. Our vision for the college is the same as it is for the church, and the church is, uh, is, is who we follow that leadership. So as you're, as you're coming up with answers, go, you know what? What would my pastor want, and how can I make that happen? So here's three solutions. Uh, one of the things that our pastor actually did for us as a staff, we have a leadership lunch of once a month where all of our teams come together from all three campuses, and we all sit in and talk and hear from our leader. And he's like, hey, for some of you, you're new, and you haven't heard this. And there's, as you can imagine, a large staff, there is some rotation that happens. Um, uh, it's a great season for our church. There's a lot of guys who have been there. Uh, including myself, now seven plus years, and we're seeing that. It's a really, really cool feeling to look around and go, man, we've been on this, doing this journey for a long time. But what it does is, 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 is he's talking to us. He hands out this. He's like, hey, here are 10 things you should know about John Lindell. And I was like, and I'm reading it, and I, my, part of my job, my responsibility on Sunday because of my travels and different things, um, is at least that's what I tell myself is the reason I do this, uh, and, and my love for my pastor is I just stand beside my pastor on Sunday. 
I walk with him from the time he gets out of his office and he's hanging out with people, I walk with him. He's, you can imagine, as it is for you, a lot of people are asking things for on Sunday. He's walking through the hall and like, hey, pastor, could you help? Or we need this or this is happening. And missionaries come through the church and, hey, pastor, I set up a meeting. And, and so what our team does is that there's several of us guys, we'll write notes for our pastor. Hey, you were having that conversation. I know you're on your way into the, to the sanctuary, to the auditorium, but um, hey, I wrote, we wrote it down and we, we sent it to his assistant on Monday morning. Because our pastor's a man of his word, and if he says, I'm going to help somebody, then guess what? He wants to help them. And how many of you have ever been busy on Sunday morning? Anyone? <laughs> He's like, I don't like hallway conversations with the staff. You're always welcome to call me. You're always welcome to set up an appointment. But if I'm heading somewhere and I'm not in my office, then I'm heading somewhere. You know, and he's like, if you have a problem, come up with at least three solutions before you bring me the problem. Oh, I, that was one of my favorites. I was like, you're the man. Well, that's a great idea. I should have some type of idea before I bring you the problem. Wow, that's brilliant. <laughs> you know, I'm like, I've been in ministry 20 years, and I've never thought to do that for him. That's amazing. And so you want to do that for your leader. So you've got Abishai who's going, hey, I want to I help. Can I tell you not to get ahead of your leader? He's like, I didn't come down here to kill him. I, come, I came down here because the Spirit prompted me to. So he goes back up, hollers down to Jonathan, the, or, or, it's uh, uh, the general of his army, and he hollers down, he's like, hey, hello, wake up. And immediately they wake up and they know it's David. Who is it? You're like, really? <laughs> I'm the one that just stole your spear and I stole your water jug and I could have killed your leader. But you were more worried about laying close to the fire and getting the attention than you were about protecting your leader. Shame on you. Can I encourage you today not to be caught up with titles, not to be caught up with position, but really to be caught up with the goal and the vision of the church, God's vision for his church, to be caught up in saying, you know what, I want more of God, not more of my title. Because when we get titles and we get, we get um, opportunity, when we get position, it, we begin to drop our guard and we begin to drop our passion. I love that our pastor every single Sunday parks in the farthest corner of our church parking lot. By the way, that's not a small parking lot. You walk the perimeter of our parking lot, it's one mile. So it's a big parking lot. And every Sunday morning, rain or shine, he parks in that back corner. So you know what I've begun to do over the last, you know, four or five years? I try to beat my pastor to church. And I park my car right next to where he would park. And he gets out. I don't make him get in my car. He pulls up. I get out of my car before he gets there. He pulls up. So what are you doing? He always asks, what's going on, man? Hey, pastor, can I park your car for you this morning? Oh, man, you don't need to do that. Yeah, I do. Because you don't need to be walking across the parking lot in the rain, in the snow. Pastor, it's 102 today. You don't need to do it. Let me take care of you. Take care of you, leader. Then there's Absalom, David's son. Are you, are you feel familiar with that story? Absalom always causing trouble, always putting his two cents in. And Absalom basically is kicked out of the city because of what he had done, because of his sin. It tells us a story uh, in 2 Samuel 13 to 15. And again, I'm not going to read it all, and I've got other points, and you're welcome to my notes if you'd like, and not that this is like, you're like, man, I've got to have those, but you're always welcome to look at what I've prepared. But um, Absalom sits outside of the city gate as people are coming in basically to apologize and make penance for what they've done to the king. And they're coming in, they're bringing their, office, their offering, their sacrifices, and they're coming in, and Absalom's sitting, and by the way, they say Absalom's a good-looking guy. So he's drawing people's attention. And he's sitting back. He's leaning back on the gate. And as people are coming in, he's like, hey, 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 how are you doing today? Good to see you. Hey, what's going on? 
oh, I'm coming and I've got to bring my offering, my penance to the king. And oh, you know what? Hey, listen, you don't need to do that today. Don't worry about it. I'll take care of it for you. And people are like, oh, thank you. You know what? You're on my side. I, I know pastor said we shouldn't do that, but I'm glad that you think that we should. Because you know what? That's what, I, that's what our church really needs. And the gossip line begins. And then disunity happens. Let me tell you what happens quickly when, when we begin to um, live like an Absalom. We put things in our own hands. Um, when we put things in our own hands, we can leave people abandoned and desolate. I'll take care of this. When really they could have went and gotten help, the help they needed, the repentance that they needed, because it's not all about just feel good on Sunday mornings. There are real issues that people need to deal with, and because they haven't dealt with them, or people say, hey, it's okay, we'll keep it between me and you. They never get the freedom that they need. They never get the deliverance that they need. They never get the help they need or their family needs. Who are we to stand in the way of that? Here, here's another thing that happens. When we uh, put things in our own hands, it brings bitterness and death. 2 Samuel uh, 13, 23 through 29 talks about uh, Absalom himself is being chased by David's mighty men. And David tells his mighty men, listen, Absalom has hurt me again, yes, but don't touch him, he's my son. And they didn't listen to their leader, and they took their own vision and their own passions, and they chased Abs after Absalom. He had long, wavy hair. Are you guys familiar with the story? It's not really a story we share too much in children's ministry. And then they drove the swords through his stomach. You know, he was like, oh, you know, mommy. And, uh, but they, as he's on his horse, he's going through the, the trees, and his hair gets caught up, and he hangs himself in the tree. And two men come upon him, two guys, and they said, let's kill him. And one of the guys says, no, 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 the heart of our leader is to leave him alone, to bring him back, to restore him, bring him back into the kingdom. And he goes, not today, I'm tired of it. And he kills him. So what's it do to David? David comes back, and what happens? When he gets the news, does anyone know the story? What does David do? He mourns. He goes to the whole sackcloth and ashes. He's pouring the ashes over his head for, for, for long periods of time. He's heartbroken. So where we begin to carry out our own vision, we can break the heart of our leader. We don't want to do that. Matter of fact, our, our leader, our pastor, has taken some time off right now uh, to rest. Uh, he had an injury back in May. Uh, Pastor Debbie actually had an injury. This is public because she shared it in front of 10,000 women at our women's conference. Uh, she was on a mountain bike in, in Colorado. They were just taking a vacation, and she stepped off the bike, got her foot caught. She fell, and um, she says, she's like, I fell down the side of the mountain. No, she just fell to the sidewalk, and, um, and she um, shattered her pelvis in multiple spots. Pastor had a pulmonary embolism got up into his brain, um, should have, in all realities, could have died while he was in Italy on a journey of Paul tour. And uh, our pastors, man, let's go. Let's, let's win people to Jesus. Are we doing our best to bring people to the church? Are we talking about it? Listen, our pastor is responsible, and, and Pastor Debbie, they invite more people to church than anyone I know. Just remember that. When's the last time you invited someone to church? Just a little side note. So they're resting. So before he left, and, and we're in our prayer time, we, we pray every Sunday morning at 7.30. And I said, hey, I think I, think I just want to say something. And I don't say things in that meeting. Seven years I've been on staff, I've never just said, hey, can I say something? And I said, I think it's our responsibility as a staff while he's resting, not to be letting up and letting off the guard, but to, to bear his arms even more. Because the last thing he needs is for us to, for, to get a phone call while he's trying to rest about something dumb that we've done. And they're all like, okay. <laughs> we leave people in a place that they were never left to be. 
When we put things in our own hands, it deflects leadership and ultimately the glory of God. It deflects their leadership and the glory of God. Man, can you imagine what the story could have been and if Absalom had been welcomed back into the kingdom? If he'd been welcomed back into those moments? So, what are we doing? How are we thinking? Loophole thinkers, Absaloms, think I'll handle this issue myself rather than, the leadership, and let, rather than let leadership know. I'll be, keep it between me and you. I'll question everything and think about it, uh, think my way out of it. Hey, I know I should probably talk to pastor about what happened, what I did, but I don't want to burden him, so I'll just take care of it myself, which ends up in a bigger mess, and then the next day they get word of it. Hey, how come you didn't call me? How come you didn't talk to me? How come I had to find out from someone else other than one of my generals? I'll work ahead of my leadership than re- rather than work with my leadership. Well, they're just going so slow, they don't know what's happening, and we could really grow this ministry to something great if they would just do it my way. No, they probably have more experience than you. Well, I'm older than my pastor. Well, guess what? The vision is still given directly to the leader and then carried out. Here's how legacy thinkers think. How does this affect my own personal covenant with God? How is what I'm doing really affect my own personal covenant and relationship with God? Does what I'm about to do lead me toward holiness with God or holes in my life with God? Legacy thinkers, I'll get there early to help carry out the vision. Legacy thinkers think, I'll trust leadership even when it doesn't feel good. Ooh. If we're going to leave a legacy in our community, in our town, in our, in our city, in our county, then we have to ask that question, will I trust leadership even when it doesn't feel good? Legacy thinkers think, I'll work with my leader, not against my leader. So what's your vision? You should always answer that question and it should sound a lot like your pastor's vision. I know that my vision, even as a part of the college, is to reach young families. That's, That's who we are as a church. We're constantly changing things to continually reach young families. Children's ministry is very important to James River Church. Early childhood, Tammy told me last night, she's like, I gotta, I gotta change this in my notes. And I'm like, why? What? Why? She's like, well, you told him it was like 800 students a week, or 800 early childhood kids a week. So zero to four-year-olds, 800 kids a week at James River Church. That's a lot of baby holders, right? That's a lot of moving parts. And she, I'm like, I'm sorry. I said, I know, we don't talk about numbers a lot at James River Church. It's really hard to find numbers. And she's like, no, nah. she's like, we're getting closer to 1,000 kids a week. I was like, oh, my poor wife. I'll just stay over in the opposite corner. We're literally in the opposite corner of the building. I'll stay with the college, and you just keep holding those babies, <laughs> you know. And uh, what I love about my wife, she can't get enough. And uh, it's amazing. So um, zero to four-year-olds, we have uh, early childhood department, and then Uh, kindergarten through fifth grade. Uh, We also have a great focus. We have rooms created for them. We have broken down different areas. It's really a great thing. If you're ever in Springfield, Missouri, for whatever reason you would be there, please come by and see us. Honestly, we'd love to give you a tour, host you, come be a part of our prayer service on Wednesday where we'll have across the three campuses near 3,000 people praying every single week. Um, You want to change the world, then start praying. If you want to change your community, start praying. Pray and uh, work, work like it's up to you, but pray like it's up to God.